All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I I'm Ivanelli Raphael, and I am Assistant Director from the Student Financial Services Department. And this is my colleague, Rick, Rick Joseph. He's also an Assistant Director at the East, uh, Student Financial Services Department. Um, if you didn't know already, we're actually located right across the street at 72 Fifth Avenue on the second floor. Uh, we accept walk-in, so we usually don't take in appointments unless it's absolutely necessary. You can walk in any time between 10 a.m. and 4.45 p.m. Um, the majority of our students do like to email, so we also accept emails as well as phone calls. So we're going to start. So student financial services kind of incorporates numerous aspects of financial aid. Uh, usually it involves through like either loans or grants through the federal government, institutional aid, such as the scholarships you may have received from your acceptance letter. And then uh, we also incorporate, and uh, when, once you complete the FAST fund on um, FAST.ed.gov, it generates something called an estimated contribution that we kind of calculate to see what families can contribute as well. We also have other resources that we can provide you, such as outside scholarships and various things that you can ask us about later on if you have any questions. So the, uh, the FAFSA is something called the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's located on fafsa.e.gov, and in order for you to apply for it, you need something called a FSA user ID. They kind of implemented that about two years ago. You would make sort of like a username and password to log into all the federal database websites, such as studentloans.gov, fafsa.e.gov, and all the websites are kind of interconnected, and they use the same FSA ID to kind of help you access it and complete the different FAFSAs depending on the academic year you're trying to complete. Yeah, so by now I assume the majority of you have received a financial aid award letter, whether or not it's including federal aid or just your merit scholarship. Show of hands if you've completed your FAFSA application already. Okay, wonderful. So just keep in mind that with this FSA ID, which is what you use to log into your FAFSA as well as signing it, you're going to need that login for in information to apply for federal direct graduate plus loans if you decide to do that. <clears throat> so just keep in mind the sources of aid um, when we're talking about the federal government, which is what's offered by FAFSA, is federal work study, federal student loans, and veter veteran benefits. Um, the new school, we provide you information on your merit-based aid, which is what's awarded to you by your admissions department in addition to possible external scholarships that you may qualify for. Um, in terms of a, a alternative loan funding, you want to look into private loans or going back to the Federal Direct Graduate Plus Loan. So, if you, we do receive something from the FAFSA, and we do see that a correction needs to be made, a mistake was made, or sometimes the federal government randomly selects different FAFSA applications, we may be selected for verification. Uh, this isn't something to panic about. It's something that we do need to collect the tax documents for and make and manually make the corrections on the FAFSA. Uh, you should be receiving information about that later on towards the year if you're applying for the fall semester. From uh, we re uh, rely on uh, a website called the School Servicing Center to assist us in collecting the documents and correcting the information that you made on the FAFSA. Generally, the information we need is either the tax returns or W-2s verification worksheet that they will ask for. Um, and if you haven't filed taxes, various documents to just kind of prove that so we can kind of move forward with it, correct the information, and give you the aid you need. Yeah. Within the next 10 business days, if you did complete a FAFSA and you were selected for verification and you decided to place your tuition deposit, you'll receive a notification on your student portal. Um, and it's going to let you know that you need to start logging into the School Servicing Center website. It's a third party that we've hired to handle this verification process. Um, so just keep in mind that this verification is very important because it can delay, if you decide to borrow your federal student loans, it can delay disper disbursement on that. So for federal student aid, international students are not uh, eligible for federal student aid. What uh, international students usually rely on and what we provide them is the institutional scholarship that we provide based on the application um, to the school which you may or may not have received on your award letter already. Um, now, for students who are eligible for federal aid, they may be eligible up for, for up to $20,500 for the academic year in unsubsidized loans. Now, that's not the exact amount you'll be receiving. There is a small 
like processing fee loans take out. So generally for the unsubsidized loans, it comes out to about $10,141 per semester. That's what students eligible for federal student loans can receive. Um, this does not include grad plus loans. This is just the regular unsubsidized graduate loans. Now, uh, in order for you to receive those loans, you also need to do two things. You need to complete a master promissory note and an entrance counseling on studentloans.gov that you would access using the FSA ID. The master promissory note is like is you is basically promising the government that you're going to pay the go the loans back six months after you fall below half time or after you graduate. And the entrance counseling is like a little quiz. It's just explaining the policies of the loans to you, whether you know what's the interest rate, you know how much am I borrowing, you know what's the different repayment options, things like that. Uh, you can apply for additional loans for the grad plus loans that my colleague mentioned on studentloans.gov, <clears throat> and you can also track how much loan debt you have by visiting a website called nslds.gov. It's a really important website. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, what the... So that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So subsidized loans are only available for undergraduate students. The difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans is that subsidized loans do not accrue interest while you're in school. Okay? As so and for unsubsidized loans, as soon as the money pays to the school, the interest will start to accrue. And those are the only regular Stafford unsubsidized um, Stafford like loans that graduate students would be eligible to receive. The only other options would be either the Grad Plus loan or the private alternative loan. But that's a good question. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So students are also eligible for that merit scholarship based on the strength of the application that they've submitted to the admissions office. Mm -hmm. um, so. The majority are renewable per academic year. You know, you just have to, you know, if you do decide to like change programs or anything like that, or if you're not sure about anything, but that may affect your scholarship or your financial aid award letter, just come and let us know. We're, we're definitely not mindless robots. We're here to help you. <laughs> so just come and let us know if you have any sort of questions about what may affect your scholarship or what may affect your loans. Yeah. Good. One of the popular questions is why isn't my merit scholarship showing on my bill? It's very likely to do with your enrollment. Um, if you say that you're going to be a full-time student, but you're only enrolled for six credits, that's considered part-time. So your scholarship's not going to reflect on your invoice until you've reached your full-time enrollment. You're not required to be full-time students for most programs. I believe it's minimum credit of six um, to receive your merit. Um, it's depending on which program you're in. So if you decide to be part-time or you decide to just change your enrollment for the full uh, two years and just let our office know so we can adjust your scholarship accordingly. Most scholarships for graduate students are percentage based. So it could be between like, you know, 30%, 75%, whatever it is. So if you want to know kind of exactly how much it is, just feel free to ask us and we can kind of just do a quick calculation for you. Okay, but it all depends on your enrollment though. Like, you know, the more you enroll, the higher the percentage would be. So uh, in order also for you to re keep receiving scholarships and financial aid and uh, federal aid, you do need to complete something called satisfactory academic progress. Now, what that means is that not only do you have to con maintain your GPA of at least a 3.0 for, for, for graduate students, excuse me, you also need to maintain a completion ratio of 67%. Now, that means you have to com like complete 67% of the classes you attend. So if you've completed 12 out of 18 credits, that means you're you know, you, 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 must, you must complete 12 out of 18 credits to, to earn 67% completion for that semester. Now, if this is for the entire time you're at the new school, or for any school that you're at for that matter, if you're trying to pursue a, a, grad, a graduate degree. So just keep that ratio in mind, because that's kind of like a universal uh, like ratio that all schools use. And furthermore, you also need to not exceed 150% of the time frame of completing a degree. So let's say, for example, a degree is 120 credits, you can't exceed 180 credits of that degree. So you have to make, keep, complete that degree within that time frame. Okay? So just tips for students and families. Definitely have a financial plan. You know, just don't rely from year to year to year to kind of just wing it and say, okay, I'll just pay it as it, as it comes try to have a financial plan going into you know the different academic years that would be occurring you know based on your degree um, apply for outside scholarships you know if you guys do want 
the uh, outside scholarship link that we can provide you on our website. We're more than happy to give you the cards to kind of email us or call us for any sort of questions you may have. And uh, definitely observe the priority filing deadlines. Uh, the priority deadlines, fi filing deadlines is, uh, is, is when? For, for April 1st. April 1st, yes. Um, and constantly check your email for updates and calls to action. Um, you know, if we do, you know, we do respond to emails regularly. So please make sure to keep checking your new school email or whatever email you provided us that you yeah, you would prefer contact on. Generally, it's the new school email. That's what we kind of put on the top to like respond to students and check that consistently. If you do have any sort of questions or you need updates or you're just willing to or, or you just need further assistance regarding your account. Um, if you do want other people to call on your behalf to access your account or to like, you know, or pay or just generally inquire, definitely fill out something called a FERPA form. Um, that will allow your mom, your dad, your uncle, what have you, to kind of call in and, and ask questions about your account and genuinely insist you if you do want other people to access your account. Okay. Um, you can also add, you know, a, you know, an authorized user to your account on your student portal. So, you know, please feel free to log in and do that. So uh, furthermore, when you guys receive the award letter, you're going to receive a number on there called cost of attendance. Now, that cost of attendance is going to be significantly bigger than what the actual cost of tuition is. And don't let that number like scare you. That cost of attendance is made up of different types of costs called direct and indirect costs. And it's not what we're actually going to be billing you. Right? The cost of attendance is simply what the total estimated cost of going to whether it, and that includes tuition and fees, but it also includes other things like what we assume that you would be paying for transportation, room and board, you know, miscellaneous expenses, books and supplies, different things like that. So that cost of attendance is something that we calculate and is estimated, and it also can be, you know, uh, fluctuated depending on if you're paying additional rent. That would be something that you would contact our office for in order if you would like us to adjust that number. But that is definitely not what you would be paying the school directly. All right. We also use that to determine what's the maximum amount of eligibility we can award you for financial aid. So if you're applying for like an outside loan, for example, we cannot go over the cost of attendance. So that's just the second use of that number. So this is just an example of how we kind of calculate that. You know, we, we use tuition, fees, books and supplies, food, housing, transportation, personal expenses. If you do need something, for example, like an additional computer or something to kind of increase the cost of attendance, that's something that you would contact our office for, and we can adjust it for you. If you're, you know, uh, have something access to some sort, of, some sort of outside loan or outside scholarship that would be coming in to kind of assist you in paying for your tuition, then you can just kind of contact us, and we can adjust it for you. I just want you to, if you go back, sure. this this is a 2018-19 cost of attendance. So this was based off of the previous academic year. Um, the new tuition and fees was recently posted, and we haven't updated this form to reflect that. But if you log into the new school website, you'll be able to see the updated tuition and fees there. This is the academic year, so it's only for fall and spring. If you decide to enroll in a summer uh, semester, you would have to let our office know, and then we can update your cost of attendance to include that. Exactly. We would have. We also have something called a summer aid application that just kind of uh, lets the department know like how many credits you're enrolling in the summer and whether you do plan to attend the summer, and then we can adjust your cost of attendance accordingly and include the summer semester in there. Correct. Yes. So this is eighteen. That's a charge for eighteen credits total. But again, this is for the eighteen nineteen year. <laughs> Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, I believe if you want to maintain a full-time enrollment, that's what it is, uh, nine credits per semester. Oh, did you, do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if you guys do want to know, you know, each, like, Parsons graduate has different kind of tuition charges, depending on the program that you're interested in. If you want to know what kind of the exact charge would be for tuition, you know, feel free to ask us. Okay. Um, so I understand there's an option for um, going on part time for the last semester. Um, and then with that, you can take 18 credits for the first three semesters and then going part time for the last semester. Well, that's the situation. 
you would be charged per credit. And so I believe there's one program in Parsons that has a flat rate tuition. I'm not sure which one that is, so. Eventually, just be charged per credit, and if you received a merit scholarship, it would just remain at the same tuition discount. So, if you received a 20% scholarship, it would be 20% off of that part time enrollment. So, this is so what it, yeah, depending on which program you're in, that's what it costs per credit. Um, yeah, it could be between 1625 to 2185 um, per credit. So if you know what graduate program you're in, you know, you could just uh, kind of calculate how much would it be per credit. And then, you know, we, depending on the, you know, if you did receive like a merit-based date or not, then that would be a percentage off of that tuition. Yeah, so if you're not enrolled in any of these programs, then you would be under all other graduates, and that's what you would be charged. And these are per semester, per term prices. Yes. So uh, for the new school process, the priority deadline for FAFSA, uh, for the FAFSA is, uh, is uh, you know, for the FAFSA code, it's 002780. So just keep that in mind. If you can't, if you don't remember that code, you can always just look up the drop down menu and you can just choose, you know, the new school. Some, um, also, when you're looking for the, the master promissory note, on studentloans.gov, it's new school comma the, so just uh, just search by that. If, you, if you're trying to find the master promissory note or entrance counseling, what school it will be sent to. Um, so new students will be receiving estimated awards. So that uh, estimated award you receive for merit scholarship, it will be properly changed and reflected once you register for the proper amount of courses you plan on doing so. So if you register for like nine credits instead of six credits, your scholarship will be adjusted because it is a percentage-based scholarship. Um, so continuing students must complete uh, verification to receive you know, a renewal award letter. So you know you will not be able to, your financial aid basically will not be able to post at all without that verification being done. The verification is very important. You know, it does not allow to us to kind of add any federal aid or anything along those lines until that aid is done. But you don't need to submit a verification to receive merit-based scholarships. That's correct. The merit-based scholarships are institutional aid, and though that will post regardless of whether or not you were so you complete the verification. So um, that estimated award letter will be sent to your new school account, and you can always access that on your student portal. And also, also there's a tracking letter emailed to your new school account. And uh, you should also be receiving regular flags if something comes up that we kind of want to notify you of. Whether you're missing a master promissory note or missing an entrance counseling, you'll see it kind of flag up on your student portal. So if you do see anything that needs to be completed, or if you've completed already and you still see it on your account, just shoot us an email. We'll be more than happy to kind of resolve that issue. Um, emails are also sent to the student to you know you guys' uh, email address at the new school. That's the primary email we use. So please make sure to check that often. And uh, fall invoices will be available for viewing uh, very early, actually in July. So, um, and also invoices for the spring semester will be available around January, like with the due date of January 10th. And they'll contain all the current financial aid information at the date of the invoice. And at the end of the academic year, when you guys need to file and need a 1098T, we can also provide you the link for that as well. Uh, if you, you would email the student accounts office and they'll just send you the directions to kind of access your 1098T. I know that's like way in the future, but I'm just giving you that information now. Uh, do any of you guys have any questions at all? Yes. So I tried to, uh, the, uh, I did the, the entrance, the counseling, but somehow it's the overlapping with the years. That um, when I contact financial aid, because my status was still on hold, be saying that uh, I was built up the, the the wrong year, but there uh, on the governor um, the website, I there's no um, the the section that I can choose that for correct. Like I was applying for the fall of 2019, but I wasn't sure what year I was like coming for. Yeah, you know, that. that's a great question. So she's letting us know that her entrance counseling was completed, but it was for the 2018-19 year, not the current 2019-20 year, and that has been happening. 
Um, the student loan site gov website, they won't have the 2019-20 entrance counseling available until April 15th, and that's when you can start applying for your graduate plus loan. Just try not to apply too soon for your grad plus loans. They have a credit expiration date of about six months. So if you wait too long, if you apply too early, by the time we can actually certify the loan, it'll expire. So try to apply just like a little, a little closer to the, towards the semester. So yeah, essentially, what if you recommend applying? Essentially, you want to write, um, you want to start having your graduate plus loan or all of your financial aid set to cover your invoice by August first, because that's if you decide to enroll in a payment plan that's when your first payment will be due in a five month payment plan, or if you decide to just borrow your student loans, um, you want everything to be set by August 10th, which is actually when your entire invoice is due by the student accounts department. Can you talk about the payment plan options and all that? Yeah, so the payment plans um, are offered by the student accounts department. They vary from five months, four months, and two months. So it's basically your balance divided between those amount of months. Um, your five-month payment plan begins August 1st. Your four-month payment plan would begin September 1st. And I believe the two-month payment plan also begins in August. Um, essentially, there's no interest on the payment plan, so you're just paying exactly what your balance is. There is a enrollment fee of $55 to enroll in the payment plan, and that's per semester. So if you're enrolling in it twice, you're going to get charged two times for the enrollment uh, for the payment plan. Uh, if you decide to pay with a credit card, there is a convenience fee, um, and it's 2.875%. So it's best to, if you decide to enroll in a payment plan, it is the best option if you don't have to borrow student loans, because there's no interest, you're just paying your balance out of pocket. Um, I would recommend you do that, but if you're going to be paying with a credit card, then just keep in mind that you're going to be charged that extra fee. Any other questions? You had showed a um, diagram <coughs> per term. Can you go back to that? I'm sorry. Sure. It's like two or three back. Yeah, talk. No, it's per program. Oh, so we want to go to tuition and fees. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, sorry. Go to full screen. I want to make sure I understand. Okay. okay. So, Per semester. Per semester. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's that cost, and you can enroll in up to 19 credits and get that same flat rate of 25,875. Oh, and then the per credit tuition is if you're under 12 credits. Exactly. Yes. Then you would look at the 1,810 times 18 for the year, which is for full and spring. Yeah. So that would be uh, 1,810 times 9, times 18, right? Right, yeah. for full and spring. That particular program. Yeah, yes. if, if it's not global executive or if no, you're no, it's okay. the last one. Yeah, okay. If it's the last one, then it'll be you know, times 18 for the academic year, times 9 per term. <coughs> right, okay. No problem. That's a great question, and I'm not 100% sure. That's more of an admission question. I don't know when they're going to start. As new students, I believe you have to attend uh, a possible orientation or something like that. So you may want to ask any admission representative that you come across. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you got a merit scholarship, um, how is that like for? If this program has multiple years, is it for? Yeah, it, it's renewed years. each year. Okay. So, like, if if you're coming back to you know to the next academic mm -hmm. year, uh, we'll just put it on to the next okay. academic year. Exactly. No. So the merit-based scholarship is what's offered to you by the admission department, and after once you're in, it's it's going to just remain at the same tuition discount each semester. It's not going to increase.
Any other questions? All right, so I just want to keep in, I just want you guys to keep in mind that all of com the communication from our office, the admission office, registrar, it's all going to go to your student portal email. I'm sorry, your new school email. So just be mindful and always check your student portal. Um, always check to see if there's any student re requirements that are being requested from our office or any other office. If there is and you're just not sure what they are, please reach out to us either in person, by email, phone call, um, so that we can get back to you. Um, you don't want to leave that unsettled because essentially you don't want your your balance to impact your, you staying in class. So please don't ignore something <laughs> we send you, please. Just, you know, either answer or please ask if you have any questions. You know, we're, we're definitely here to help. Yeah. For the student portal, the um, single sign-on? It's, yes, it's the my.newschool.edu. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But if anything, don't guess on something. If anything looks funny or if you're completely unsure, just reach out and we're more than happy to help you. The new school does not offer loans, but we do offer information on private lenders. Um, if, or you can look into, if you qualify for FAFSA, then you can look into Federal Direct, the Federal Direct Graduate Plus Loan or the Federal Unsubsidized Student Loan. Mm -hmm. Then private loans would be your option or enrolling in a payment plan at the new school. We can't recommend specific lenders to you for private loans, but we do have a comparison tool that will kind of compare the rates of different lenders to you. But each lender has different like uh, payment plans or rules stipu or stipulations with them. So you have to do the research beforehand in order to kind of make a choice. But just be mindful that after you apply for a, a, a private loan, normally it's about 10 days before it would actually disperse if you're, if you're already enrolled in a particular program. So you have to give it that time. So if you're like already enrolled and you really need money ASAP, you have to give it about 10 days for an alternative loan to post if you're already attending the class, okay? So that brings up uh, refunds. Um, a lot of our graduate students do use their federal student loans um, to help for their educational expenses, such as living. Mm. Um, the aid that you're scheduled to receive disperses um, the first day of class. It doesn't disperse to before. Um, so which that means your refund, you won't get that until another, I would say, five to seven business days after the first day of school. So don't expect your refund that day. It's going to take at least a week for you to receive it. Um, if you sign up for a direct deposit, great. If you don't, then it's going to be mailed to you, which means that the business time frame is going to take a little bit longer. So you're saying the federal loans will post to the school and then a school or whatever the coverage is? Yes. Yes, exactly. exactly. So you're okay. So Exactly. Yeah, because we have to, re you know, review it. You know, if, if you withdrew, you, you may still be eligible for a portion of the loan. There's different things that we have to do before we can send it out. Are all merit-based scholarships from the department we apply to not through your office? Correct. Yes, exactly. Yes. All right, well guys, thank you for coming. Um, I think we're here again at two o'clock if you want to come back again. You're more than welcome. Yeah, please. <laughs> but enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you so much for coming.